So okay. the introduction will be really short because we want to hear you, not me. Do I still get 20 minutes, even though we're starting late? Of course. <laughs> Hong Kong English phonology, product of an emergent post-colonial English. But is it? That's the question. <laughs> Far ahead. Hi, right, well, that's not actually a question I'm asking. So um, in the talk, I'll give some historical background about Hong Kong, um, the emergence of Hong Kong English as a variety. And I'll look at some studies that I've done uh, with colleagues on Hong Kong English phonology. Um, OK, so this is a map of Southeast Asia and you can see where Hong Kong is there. Um, it's uh, to the southeast of uh, China or it's part of uh, China in the southeast there. Um, and um, it was a former protectorate of the UK and the handover back to China took place in 1997. It came under direct British rule in 1842 and the name Hong Kong is not actually attested in written sources until that date. Britain was granted a 99 year lease of the new territories, including Lantau Island in 1898. And if you have a look at this map, which shows um, Hong Kong in more detail, um, you can see that the new territories are the, the largest part really of Hong Kong. And it, it was considered that it wouldn't be possible for Hong Kong to be sustainable um, without the additional areas for farming and, and agriculture and, and, and eventually industry. So previously um, it was just Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon Peninsula, and it was only the um, new territories and Lantau Island that were ceded for this um, 100 year lease. Um, so in 1984, the joint declaration, the Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed and um, administrative control of the region returned to the PRC on the 1st of July 1997. And I was actually in Hong Kong when this happened um, and you could see that it all being televised and so on and the ceremony and you could see the uh, soldiers of the Red Army marching over the border um, at um, at noon. This was referred to as the handover and the idea was that it would be one country with China but two systems. So Hong Kong was going to be treated differently by China and it was agreed that that would last for a period of 50 years after the handover. Um, so the language situation is sometimes referred to as trilingual and biliterate. And I should point out this is the language situation with Hong Kongers. Um, there are lots and lots of people in Hong Kong with a variety of different languages going on. So this is talking about people who are Hong Kong Cantonese speakers. Um, and the idea is that they're trilingual in Cantonese, Mandarin and English, and they're biliterate in Chinese and um, English because Cantonese um, uses the same, well, it uses a, um, a more traditional set of symbols than, than um, Chinese um, Mandarin does for example, but it uses those symbols um, for literacy. English in Hong Kong has been described neither as a typical learner language um, or a typical new variety, and Lee calls it um, value added. So it's something that people feel adds, adds value to them if they're able to speak this language. And it's also been noted that it is an important aspect of Hong Kong identity for some. And this is, uh, we can see studies that were just after the handover that said that, um, but also Hanson Edwards um, and Chan have reported this as well. Um, so Hanson Edwards more recently. Um, I've just realized I don't have my microphone pinned to me, so that might be, sound might be a bit better now. Um, so what are some of the segmental features of Hong Kong English phonology? This is from a study by Hung. Um, he said, if we look at vowel monophthongs, British English has 11, um, and here are the symbols for them. I'm not going to go through them. I'll assume you know what they are. Um, the Hong Kong monophthong inventory is um, much smaller, and there are no distinctions um, between vowels, uh, the kit and fleece vowels, the dress and trap vowels, the cloth and thought vowels, and the goose and foot vowels. And these are from um, John Wells's lexical sets um, for looking at accents of English. Um, Hong Kong English diphthongs are considered to be similar to British English, however. 
Um, where consonants are concerned, um, plosives in initial and medial position are similar to British English, and uh, Cantonese actually has aspirated initial plosives, um, where we'd say that our plosives were voiceless and voiced, they have aspirated and unaspirated, but they're very similar to what you get in British English. And there's no vowel lengthening before voiced plosives, there's strong glottal reinforcement, so back and bag sound different for me, but in Hong Kong English they'll be back and back. Um, and for fricatives, there's no voiced fricatives in Hong Kong English. So, for example, British English v is pronounced as w or f. It, so, vine, for example, is usually wine, and leave is leaf, um, pronounced like that with this vowel shortening as well. Um, median approximates are similar to British English. Nasals are also similar, but uh, my colleague Kathy Wong and I um, studied this merger between L and N in syllable initial position. Um, so night and light sound the same, for example, for some speakers. Um, we get vocalized L at the end of a syllable, so feel rather than feel. This is similar to many varieties of English, including Cockney. And there's no difference between uh, clusters that have a consonant followed by r or a consonant followed by w. So the words twin and trim both begin um, tr like this. So you get twin uh, and twin. I've got those around the wrong way, but anyway, they sound the same. Um, we also noted that there is some systematicity in final cluster um, deletion. Um, and I found, for example, that um, uh, the uh, Hong Kong English consonant clusters are more simplified than those in British English when I looked at my spoken data and previously Peng and, and I had found that um, there was systematicity in the deletion in final clusters um, with a couple of speakers that we looked at their phonological um, their phonological inventories. So we noticed that there's an evidence of varietal development. If we've got speakers that are doing the same kinds of deletions um, in similar places, then that this would indicate varietal development. Um, I also looked at juncture cues in three varieties of English. So I looked at Hong Kong, Singapore and British English, and we included pairs like Y pink and wipe ink, my train, and might rain. Um, we had speakers produce them in sentential context and then we clicked those out and asked people to listen to them and see if they could tell the distinctions between them. Um, so I'm looking here at the perception data so if people could tell the difference. So here are the Hong Kong listeners. So we had a group of listeners from Hong Kong, Hong Kong English speakers, and um, we are showing reaction time here on the line and also um, the, um, the percentage correct. So we can see here that Hong Kong English, um, the Hong Kong listeners were more correct when they were listening to Hong Kong English and they were also quicker um, for that variety. Um, we also found that for British listeners, they did better if they were listening to Hong Kong English. Um, and although the reaction time is not as high as it is for British English, it was better than for Singapore English. It was lower than for Singapore English. And then for our Singapore listeners, we also found that they did better if they were listening to Hong Kong English stimuli. And the reaction time is very similar between the listening to Singapore English and listening to Hong Kong English and slightly higher for British English. So from this, one of our conclusions um, was that if the best performance across listeners was in Hong Kong English, does this mean that Hong Kong English could be a suitable model for English intelligibility in Southeast Asia? That was something that I thought it was worth putting out there because we're always looking for um, what's the best intelligibility model in English. If we've got people using it as a global language, um, then um, what, would, what would be the best one from a perception point of view, from an understanding point of view and so on. And, and Hong Kong English did well for all listeners. So we were quite pleased with that. Um, I've also considered speech rhythm, so I looked at the duration of tonic, stressed, unstressed and weak syllables in Hong Kong English, and I compared this with British English data. I, I just wanted to do a comparison because British English is very well attested and we don't have much on Hong Kong English, so I wasn't saying the British is correct and the Hong Kong is not correct, I just wanted to see a comparison. Um, so uh, these are my data here. This is from one of the um, results. So the red line is Hong Kong English and the green line is British English. And what we're looking at here is mean duration in milliseconds going up the y-axis 
And then along the X axis, we have the stress levels. So um, the first uh, number one is weak syllables, unstressed, stressed and nuclear. So we'd expect there to be a gradual um, lengthening um, from weak, which are supposed to be relatively short to nuclear, which is supposed to be relatively long. And we can see that we get that for both varieties. Um, we definitely get it for British English in green, but we're also seeing a distinction in um, Hong Kong English as well. But there is this convergence where, the, um, where they both converge uh, near the nuclear syllables. All of these comparisons are statistically significantly different. So each of the comparisons between the Hong Kong English stress levels, the British English stress levels, and then looking at the Hong Kong English and British English weak syllables, Hong Kong English and British English unstressed syllables, etc. The only one that wasn't was the nuclear syllables. So this is kind of saying that um, while we do get this difference, they're not um, holding that distinction. So if it was parallel, we'd expect them to be um, as far apart at the start, um, at the finish as they were at the start, for example, but we didn't find that, or I didn't find that. Um, we've also looked at speech rhythm using a very well-known metric called the pairwise variability index. There are a number of metrics for looking at speech rhythm, but this was one that we used. And we compared existing Singapore English and British data with our Hong Kong speakers. And we had sentences that had full vowels in each syllable. Um, so like birds eat worms and sentences that have reduced vowels and full vowels. So the birds have eaten all the worms. We looked at that and we used the set of sentences directly taken from the original study. Um, so the pairwise variability index gives you a number and the bigger the number, the more the variety is considered to be stress timed. If the number is lower, then the um, variety is considered to be closer to, closer to syllable timed. There are all sorts of problems with these categories, but it does show a difference in rhythm. So for Hong Kong English, the uh, full vowel set, which we'd expect to be similar in length, um, had a score of 43.3 and the reduced vowel set had a score of 53.3. So there was a difference in NPV, NPVI of 10. Um, for the Singapore English, this was from existing data, the uh, full vowel set had a slightly lower NPVI and the um, reduced vowel set also had a lower NPVI. So the difference was um, six there in NPVI. For British English, um, the full vowel set had an NPVI of 31.79, so that's the lowest. Um, and the reduced vowel set had an NPVI of 76.57. So that's a massive difference there. So we can see from this that Hong Kong speech rhythm is more similar to Singapore English speech rhythm, but it has, uh, it's more similar to British English speech rhythm than Singapore English um, speech rhythm is. Now, I also have some examples from my speakers here just to show that there's a lot of variation in the data. So it wasn't the case that we had homogeneity across all speakers. Um, and I'm hoping this is going to work. So I'm going to show you, just play you some clips from speaker five, where there's a lot of difference between the full vowel set, which we'd expect to be D, 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 and the reduced vowel set, which we expect to be more da, 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 da. Um, and speaker nine, where there is much less difference. And in fact, the speech is much more syllable time sounding. So here we go. Grace works through huge bounds each Friday. Grace was tired of Matthew Freeman. OK, and now speaker nine, which is much more similar. Grace works through huge bounds each Friday. Grace was tired of Matthew Freeman. So you can see that there is a lot of variation going on there. So it's difficult to say that from a rhythmic point of view, we've got any particular kinds of homogeneity. Um, I've also looked at intonation. So um, in our book, we considered two aspects of intonation, sentence stress and pitch and nuclear tones. And for stress, we found that it was mainly on the last syllable and there was a lack of deaccenting with repeated items, which is something that helps the listener work out what the new information is. We used interactive map task data and monologues from happy events. So it was considered to be free speech. Um, OK, so for example, speaker A says um, this is a map task. So uh, we are at the starting point. Do you see the diamond mine? And B says, yeah, I see the diamond mine. Yeah. 
and they say, so now go south until you pass the diamond mine. So they put the nucleus on mine again, and we'd expect it to be away from there and to be on the new information. So now something like, so now go south until you pass the diamond mine, something like that. But we didn't find that. We found that it was consistently on the last syllable. Um, and in this example, we can see that uh, the speaker says there are more urban area than rural area, rather than focusing on the different word, which would be urban and rural. Um, so that was something that we found. Um, we also found that speakers use a range of nuclear tones uh, in the data. The level tone was the largest. This is not surprising in free speech. There's lots of hesitations, corrections. I'm doing level tones at the moment, listing and so on. So uh, we got most of those. Then we found that the rise and fall tones were um, quite strongly attested. Fall rises, which are very common in British English, were not um, so common. And rise falls, which is the mm tone, we didn't find many of those at all. Um, and rise falls seem to be used for extra emphasis, not for things like indignation and sarcasm and being impressed, which is what we'd expect them to be used for in a variety like British English. Um, there's also evidence of uptalk. Um, so we had lots of examples of this. Um, in this example, the speaker says, well, I got quite interesting childhood um, and does a, a rising tone there. So we, we had quite a lot of uptalk in the data as well, which we thought was interesting. Um, Another study we've done on intonation is looking at intonation in a storytelling task, and this is a very particular kind of task. It's not natural speech at all. We really can't say that. Um, but we had the speakers narrate a story and then we did a variety of different things where we asked listeners to um, uh, give uh, perceptual feedback on it. And also um, we looked at the um, intonation that was used. So we had 40 Hong Kong English and 25 British English university students. Um, and we were looking at these kinds of, um, uh, these types of sentences, these types of utterances, and we anticipated based on um, published information from um, Cruttenden's book on intonation, for example, or O'Connor and Arnold, um, that these were the sorts of tones that we would expect to see if, um, if one of these kinds of utterances was used. And then we had a look to see what we did get uh, with the data. Um, so we saw evidence of emerging patterns of intonation production, so final sentence stress, so this is what we've seen before, lower incidence of fall rise tones, um, preponderance of rising tones on all question types, whether it was a WH question or a yes no question or whether it was checking or actually a real question and so on, um, and evidence of the rise fall used for sarcasm in this data. Um, we also found a strong production perception correlation by sentence types. So when we looked at the individual sentence types, this is the Hong Kong English data, we found that it actually correlated quite strongly, which, um, which we were pleased about. Now, these findings um, that we're looking at here are in line with Schneider's suggestion that Hong Kong English is at the nativization stage of the dynamic model of post-colonial Englishes. So this stage is where the variety is borrowing from the indigenous speech community, strand coining new words using strategies of word formation and adjusting the meaning of existing words to novel environmental conditions. This is all talking about words, but we also saw that we were getting that coming in the phonology as well. So it was borrowing from the um, Cantonese strand, coining um, new ways of using the phonology um, and adjusting the meaning of um, the way that the phonological information was used. So what's next for Hong Kong English? Um, as you probably know, the political situation is highly volatile. I'm not going to comment on that any further, though. Um, but because we know that Hong Kong English is seen as an identity marker, it could result in a stronger move towards endonormative development, which is phase four of um, Schneider's model, which is the place that Singapore English um, is supposed to be in at the moment, so that we get a much stronger variety with um, much more formed um, phonological features. Um, this could also result in identification kind of the other way with um, with other varieties of English, such as British English, American English and Australian English. We, we really don't know. Um, or it might simply not have an effect at all. That's something else um, that's possible. Um, OK, that's basically all I have to say. I'm uh, my, my screen says 19 minutes, 28. So I hope that's all right. Um, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. If you're interested in the references, um, then these are they. Um, I think they're also on the information that you've been sent. And um, yeah, thank you very much.
Fantastic, Jane. A lot of food for thought, and I am sure we have questions. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, you can do if you wish. Okay. Well, I don't mind. I mean, somebody might want me to go back to a slide. So let's see. yes, good idea. So Kingsley was the first hand up. He couldn't wait. So <laughs> <laughs> Jane Kingsley, going well, in the rest of Nigeria. Um, very interesting presentation, but it, it got me thinking, especially as we're talking about uh, decolonization. Um, looking at where you are um, comparing, and this is what most uh, most um, English scholars, what English scholars do, and including me, have done right. Um, we seem to perpetually continue to prioritize British English, right? When we compare, right? I, I was thinking, what? What would have been the effect, for instance, if you compared Hong Kong English with Singaporean? I remember this. Is, I think this is what um, Kachu was talking in his last book, What English Is and Culture Wars, about neutrality. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, I, because if, you, if we keep comparing these other varieties with British English, we continue to use the terms lack of, which is deficit, um, if, if, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. I say that uh, Hong Kong English lacks this. And, and that is negativist. And it, is it possible for us to focus on the variety? What's the possibility? I know it is easier said than done, right, in real research. What's the possibility of focusing on this variety and talking, describing its phonology or any other aspect of as we see it without always perpetually implying that these varieties are sore or peripheral to British English? Yeah, I've, I've often been criticised. Actually, I went to a World English Conference and, um, and people were so surprised that I was there um, because they said you're kind of viewed as this as this um, uh, as this symbol of colonialism just by appearing. Um, and I was quite horrified by that because, yeah, I, I really was quite horrified by that because actually I'm saying, well, the thing is that we have a lot of descriptions of varieties of, um, you know, British and American English. We have a lot of descriptions here. So I'm not saying that British English is correct. That's the variety that I speak. It's a variety that I know very well. Um, but you know, if we look at this this slide that I've just put back up again, um, it it doesn't say um, it doesn't say uh, the Hong Kong English mono, monothong inventory is deficit. It just says it has seven, and in some ways, that's more beautiful than having lots of different vowels. Um, and in fact, it's it's been discussed, you know, other other homegrown varieties. So I, I believe Scots is also considered just to have um, uh, have seven um, vowels in the monophone inventory. And, and that's held up as something which is possibly a standard for international communication. So um, I, I take on board that we've got this um, potential problem where if we're um, always comparing things with um, existing varieties uh, or rather older varieties of English, um, that there's this perception potentially that something is wrong in comparison with it. But I've never said that in any of the um, uh, any of the work that I've done. Having said this, I started in an English language teaching paradigm. And in an English language teaching paradigm, there is correctness and incorrectness. And this was quite difficult to get out of. And in fact, when we produced the Hong Kong English book in 2010, which does try to look at it from a varietal point of view and not say that it's, you know, deficit, um, we went on on tours um, to give talks about the book, me and my um, me and my colleagues. And uh, we gave a uh, we gave a talk to English language teachers in Hong Kong who were Cantonese and they said oh, I'm sorry we don't want to know about Hong Kong English because as far as we're concerned it's correct it's not correct we don't want to know about this variety so it's actually fighting against this mm -hmm. um, can be very hard it's a very difficult stance so you know if I was saying well actually um, if we look at what the variety is doing it's developing into um, you know something which is um, a new variety of English it's it might not be quite there yet because you know it comes out of a colonialism um, it comes out of that perspective, but we want to see what the features are and just, you know, say these are the features rather than saying that it's deficit. We actually get pushback from um, people in Hong Kong who were Cantonese Hong Kong English speakers. And that was something that surprised me quite a lot. So, no, I absolutely take this on board. Um, but, you know, we do have a lot of existing descriptions of mm. varieties like British English. And I think it's worth saying this is a difference. 
um, not saying it's incorrect. And um, as far as I'm concerned, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be reporting language like that. And I sometimes have to fight with my co-authors over this because mm -hmm. uh, I have a Hong Kong English co-author, Hong Kong Cantonese co-author um, who is always looking at it from a deficit perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So there you go. Interesting not, tension. Hmm. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but anyway. <laughs> so I agree with you, Kingsley, basically. <laughs> Maya, very, very quick, but go for it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Zeta, for, for this presentation. It's wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm also um, interested in, in these um, kind of perspectives as a teacher. Um, and I teach the pronunciation of English to French learners of, of English. And sometimes I have, uh, this year I had a Nigerian a student and it was very hard for me to say okay um i had to tell her that's also nigerian english is another standard and i told her it's really hard for me to know should i correct you or should i ask you to create a little diphthong because i tell the french students to create the diphthong mm. or what what should i do um but another thing i was really wanted to ask was i don't know much about the history of hong kong and the, um, the British teachers that came to Hong Kong to teach, but were they all teaching Southeast um, British English? Maybe if we look at the profiles of these teachers, we might find interesting things as to what kind of English they um, yeah, it, it's quite possible, but I mean, you know, historically this happens, they, it would be difficult to go back in time and find out what they were doing um, at the time. I mean, if you look at the models in textbooks, then they um, they have been, and, and there's probably a shift now because, you know, I left Hong Kong 20 years ago. Um, mm. They were um, standard Southern British stroke RP, um, that would be the British materials, and the American materials were general American, whatever that is. Um, and that was that was the um, the model on which things were based. Um, now, I'm, I'm not keen on the use of the word model. I'd prefer to say this. This is a kind of reference uh, because we have a lot of description of these. But I want to see what's going on, you know, when you speak. Um, and I, I don't know if you're aware, I'm very much involved in the pronunciation community. And we've just produced a document for um, Oxford University Press, along with some colleagues. Um, about our stance and we're interested in intelligibility in English we're not interested in people having um, an RP or Southern British Standard or General American or you know General Australian I don't study Australian so I'm sorry if I've offended anyone there but we don't have that um, as, a, as a starting point what we're saying is it's important to be intelligible um, and you know finding that Hong Kong English was the most intelligible when we looked at the juncture cues was actually something I was really pleased about because it's saying that British English you know it's it's not this fantastic thing that's understood by everybody. Um, actually, if we look at it from a juncture cues point of view, Hong Kong English is more intelligible than that variety. So, um, but it's it is a conflict, I think, in English language teaching. It's it's a tough one. Unfortunately, we really don't have any time for more questions. But I'm sure Jane would be very open to people writing to her. I know yeah, Alfred sure. raised his hand, for example. Um, so sorry, Alfred, for cutting you off there. Um, but please do write to Jane, send your question to her. She'd be very open to responding to it by email. And listen, thank you so much, Jane, for taking time to come and be with us virtually. We've hugely enjoyed it. It's been very interesting in terms of the debate afterwards, and I'm sure we'll continue to talk about it over coffee. Thank you. Take care, Jane. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.